Hey, we're back. Process preparation performance. Bill and JR here. We're moving down to the coast, JR. We're moving down towards New Orleans. We got Green Wave football in the house and Shane Meyer. How you doing, Shane? Doing good. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. JR, I do need an update, though. We're supposed to get some more bad weather over the next couple of days. Maybe some snow here in Missouri. I can't even flip and believe it. It's the middle of April. Your cars have been, like, destroyed. How are you going to protect those things, man, when this bad weather comes? What are you going to do? See, you started this thing because now my car <laughs> is like this topic of conversation for this entire podcast <laughs> from episode one. I got a bid on a carport today. Believe it or not, I'm not going to put it in myself. So uh, this is going to be the greatest carport in the history of the earth, apparently, by the time it's done. But <laughs> might as well just buy a house with a garage. But uh, I'm telling you what, it just – it never ends right now. But it wasn't just a carport, was it? Wasn't there something just that happened? To We're not even going to talk about that because <laughs> you get somebody over here. Oh, how about a screened in porch? Or why don't we put in a pool? How about we don't do nothing? <laughs> Move to a house with a garage. So thanks. Appreciate well, it. Well, you're, you're welcome. I can't, I mean, that in itself, just the life of JR would be oh, uh, a really good topic to talk about on a daily basis. Awesome. But we got to get to Shane and JR, you know, Shane from a long time, you guys uh, kind of work together and stuff. So tell us, tell us how this came about, JR. Yeah. So Shane worked at Jeff city high school. Uh, I'm still there and he was uh, in the driver's ed department where, where I'm at now, which he, he's got some similar experiences to me with that. He coached the girls basketball team was a head coach and about when was it about January? I think. Uh, uh, yeah. First week of January. Yeah, first week of January, uh, all of a sudden he, he was gone. And uh, everybody's like, where the heck did he go? And he became the director of football operations at Georgia Southern. And that whole coaching staff has moved with Coach Fritz over to Tulane. And so it's fantastic. I'm super excited we got Shane on. And this, this is going to be really good for everybody to, to kind of understand what really goes on at a Division One school. All right, Shane, I have, I have a question for you because – I was at Tulane and I was walking around and probably that, didn't see, probably didn't see any snow at Tulane. <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Doesn't see matter anything. the time of year. Probably. No, no. And I was a little jealous because it was way nicer than when I was coming from. When I walked into your, your kind of athletic building there, there's a bunch of sports housed there. And maybe it seems, I don't know if it seems tight to you or not, but when I walked in, I was immediately filled with, the successful tradition of Tulane and what all sports are in that building because it seemed like it, the atmosphere was I was just like this is an incredible place yeah we've got a we've got a great uh setup there's a you know it's the campus itself is it has its own footprint here in what is called uptown you know and it's a it's a unique setup where you know you can stand on on one end of our campus and and look down the uh, down Claiborne Avenue and, and see the Superdome and the skyline. Um, or you can be on the opposite end and be on St. Charles Avenue and see the streetcar um, and be right across the street from Audubon Park. So it is one mile from St. Charles Avenue to Claiborne. I don't know how wide the campus is, but it isn't much more than a couple blocks. So there's a unique setup to campus where on the on our end of things is basically where all the athletic facilities are. Our guys that live on campus, there's a right in between that and what would be then the academic side of campus is where they live. So it's a great setup for our guys to where they can get up in the morning, come over to our building. And then, you know, we, we call it a one-stop shop. So other than actually going to class, once a guy gets to our side of the building or our side of campus, they don't need to, to leave. So they can get everything accomplished they can in there. Connected basically to the stadium where our offices are is the practice facility for both volleyball and then men's and women's basketball. So they're only – they're less than 100 yards away from us. And then all of our other sports at least have their offices in our building, the Wilson Center. So it's great. You know, our academic center is right in there, our fueling station where all of our student-athletes can stop in and snack during the day. Uh, within the last couple of years, they put a cafeteria in our football stadium, uh, which is less than 20 yards away from our office area. So it's it, it makes it a great setup to be able to – not only see our kids, but also you see student athletes from all of the other sports coming and going, and it really becomes the central hub uh, for the student athletes on a a daily basis. You'll I'll, I'll walk in there on you know especially during the season. I'll go in there on Sunday, and 
you expect it to be quiet except for a few coaches, but there's a bunch of student athletes up in there. They come find a quiet place to study and get some stuff done and get a jump start on the week. So we're, we're seven days a week up there with, with somebody in there doing some work. And Shane, I probably should have asked this first, but you know, you went from the head girls basketball coach to the director of football ops down at Georgia Southern in a, in a rapid amount of time. And I'm curious, you know, what, what was that biggest challenge when you walked in that first day? It was like, hi, I'm the director of football ops. The good part was we were all, not all of us, but at least especially with the head coach and all the new hires, we were all coming in fresh together. Um, so it wasn't as if I was coming into a stagnant situation and had to learn how everything else was going. We were all kind of learning together. You know, and as a guy who obviously had a relationship with a with a head football coach and had worked for him before, obviously there are things you come to realize are probably part of the things that go along with being a director of football operations, and you can kind of guess those things. But you also, on a daily basis, start learning the parts of the job you had no idea existed or the meetings you would start being asked to be to, to sit in on or phone calls you'd be a part of or, or decisions and things like that. So it was just – Getting a global, having a global perspective of that job and, and what came with it. The, the great thing was, is, you know, Georgia Southern, fantastic place, Statesboro, Georgia. That's a, you talk about football hungry place, that fan base is awesome there. Uh, you know, so we walked into a place where it was open arms and everybody was excited and everybody truly had a passion for football. So it was easy to kind of hit the ground running in that regard. But just, I just think learning all of the ins and the outs of the job, especially since it was a job for the most part, I had never done that specific job before. You know, and you mentioned just your responsibility as director of football operations, and, and you'd, sent, you'd sent us kind of a list of what you do. It, it is staggering to me the amount of stuff you're juggling. I mean, you're ranging from liaising with analytics companies, looking after game tickets, facility scheduling, and all this stuff. In terms of all these hours spent, which one takes up the most of your time? Um, it's a pretty easy, well, there's probably two answers to that. You know, in my, the way my job has evolved working for Coach Fritz, uh, one of the areas that I'm probably a little bit more involved in than most director of football operations is on the academic side. We have a great situation set up where we have an outstanding academic advisor who kind of runs the show on that end. But the way we've set things up and this has evolved, and I started doing this at Georgia Southern, but we kind of let the academic folks kind of run the day-to-day -day operations and let guys know what they're supposed to do. And then I kind of come in as the hammer when guys aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And I keep track of, you know, guys who are falling behind or who kind of, for lack of a better word, need a little kick in the pants. And that allows one, that allows the head coach not to be consistently dealing with those issues. And then it also allows our position coaches to not have to deal. You know, the, the big thing when it comes to our position coaches, I try to do is what I call keep the knucklehead stuff off their desk. <laughs> uh, I try to take a lot of duties to where they can just coach football. So what I don't want to have happen is, you know, the academic folks are emailing or texting a position coach if a guy misses a tutoring appointment or is late on assignment. So I'll take a lot of that stuff. So I get real involved on the academic side of things and tracking eligibility and APR. And uh, There's a lot that goes into that. So that's a big one year round. And then during the season definitely is uh, team travel. You know, even though it's just six road games and, and hopefully you get a seventh with the bowl game. But, uh, you know, that definitely takes up, you know, there's a big difference between a road game week and a home game week. So, but even on home games, we're, we're staying in a local hotel the night before the game, got to arrange bus transportation, you know, uh, things like that. So even a, there's even some travel involved with, with a home game. But those are, the, those are the two biggest areas. And then that list can be a little deceiving. It's not as if I'm dealing with those things on a, on a daily basis, but it's Coach Fritz and I have found that what works best is I've kind of just morphed into the main point of contact. So then I kind of disperse things from there, but that way at least there's one, it allows communication to be funneled through one place. And that way I can kind of sift through it. And if it's something coach needs to know about or somebody he needs to talk to, I've, I've learned those folks. And then if it's something I can either handle myself or, or pass on and keep off his desk, I've learned that as well. So it's just a, it just makes it easier rather than somebody walking in our front door and us trying to figure out who that person's supposed to talk to. It kind of yeah. starts with me. So you see liaison attached to my name quite a bit, but that's just really the guy they start with. That may not be the guy. You brought it up, Coach. I'm really interested to know Tulane is – it's a prestigious university. When you talk about it, you're talking about a top-notch education. 
what really are the academic requirements in Tulane and how does that factor into recruiting? If you can, if you can get into that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, you bet. I mean, um, you know, our average, and I'll use ACT because I think most of the folks in Missouri and the Midwest are more used to the ACT scores, but our average ACT score, I think right now for admission is a 33. Um, and that's the average. Uh, so, and that's university wide. I, I was, that's not the foot, let me, that's not our, that's not the football team, but that's university wide for the incoming freshman class. Uh, but it, right now it's at a, at a 33. So, you know, it's, it's a tough school to get into uh, for sure. Just for, you know, for the normal student applying, it, it's it's one of the toughest ones to get into in the country for sure. We do have some uh, flexibility on, on our side of the house to, as far as relax, a little bit relaxed restrictions, as far as, you know, our guys don't have to get 33s to sure. get into Tulane. In the country at the FBS level, it's, are they an NCAA qualifier? And if they are, they can get in and get ready to go. We're obviously above that. Test scores are important. Grade point averages are important. All of that gets factored in. Key for us that we go through, coach talks about it, all the time. The number one thing we look for in recruiting is character. If a guy wants to come into Tulane and will put in the things necessary, it's, it sounds silly at this level, but just going to class, communicating, hand, what we call handling your business, turning in your assignments when they're supposed to be turned in, attending your tutor appointments, all of the enrichment. You know, we have a ton of services for guys. But if a guy will come in and want to do the work and can present himself and communicate and do things the right way and basically for lack of a better word, handle himself as an adult, we, we can get those guys to crease. And again, it may not be in, you know, molecular biology, but we've got some, some major areas where we've got a, a great Homeland Security Department, wow. outstanding business school that about a third of our guys are in right now. Uh, so there's a lot of guys who are getting business degrees, but we have some flexibility where, you know, when we get guys in, that's, that's the thing we're looking for. So they got to, they got to show that character and, and have the ability to to want to do the work. So if you get a recruit on campus on an official visit, can you kind of describe what, what would be the typical day for them? You know, in our, our official, it's recruiting is morphed and it's, it's, and I've seen it firsthand because I, I worked for a time at the division two level. So, you know, those recruiting visits, because recruiting at that level, you know, and I'll go back to the old signing day period where it was just the February signing day, but the way recruiting happened at the division two level was, we wrapped up our season and coaches started going on on the road and got out a little bit right before Christmas and the Christmas bear kit. And they tried to get out in January and get guys in for a visit. And probably when they came in on the visit was the first time they had seen your place. And it was the first time you had been around them for an extended time. So there was a lot of things that you would consider kind of nuts and bolts, making sure they were, they got a campus tour, making sure they met somebody on the academic side of things, uh, showing them kind of the A to Z of your campus and, and the way things operate, you know, and it's not just a today thing, but I think it's a difference too at the, at the FBS level where recruiting it's, there's a few times of dead periods, but recruiting is a 365 day job. And by the time the official visit rolls around for us, and even with the early signing period in December, you know, we usually, with the way the calendar falls, we get two big weekends in December with bringing in multiple kids. By the time that show comes for the most part, if even if we bring in, say, 20 kids on official visit, probably 18 of them have been to our place six, seven, eight times. Wow. And so they're coming over for games, probably been here for camp. You know, their parents are swinging them through during the summer, touring schools. They're coming over for unofficials. So by the time that weekend happens, we've kind of done all the A to Z stuff. Most of our kids that come in on visits by that time of year have committed. So now you're, you bring in 20 kids, you probably got 16 of them committed, and you're working on the last four. So we have – Evolved over the last couple of years with recruiting and especially our location being New Orleans. Uh, we've tried to make it more into a celebration, for lack of a better word. Um, a more social and relaxed atmosphere. So it's, you, you, we bring them in Friday night. You know, we they had a real nice hotel downtown, big hospitality room, snacks, ping pong table, video games. Everybody's just kind of mingling in and out. Then we had it, we, there's a, Real nice banquet hall right across the street from the hotel. We head over for dinner. Uh, we do some things over there to entertain them. And then we let our prospects head out with our player hosts. And so they got the rest of the night. But we we keep curfew a little bit shorter on that first night. And then that way we can get them up on Saturday morning. We'll let everybody sleep in a little bit. And 
we bring them up to campus for a real nice brunch where we bring in a few heavy hitters to speak, including the AD, president, if we can get on his schedule, head of academics. We then identify their intended major areas. We have a professor from that area that sits with them and their family at brunch. So they can just sit and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and ask any questions they want. And then it's worked out for us the last couple of years, especially with bowl preparation. While most of, all of our, used to be everybody attended brunch. Well, now it's just those of us off the field folks doing that. And our position coaches are out actually having practice. Okay. So okay. then uh, our kids have already toured campus. So we let them watch practice. And then that way, if a family member hasn't seen campus, we do it during that time. We leave from there. We, we head down for, for lunch, ride down by the hotel, have a nice, relaxed time. We let everybody uh, head back, take a nap, and then uh, we're back to dinner. And then one of the unique things we have in New Orleans is, and I didn't know what it was the first time I heard it when somebody proposed it, but it was a second line. Uh, so we second line through the, one of the main streets there in New Orleans, and we, we drop them off because we bring them up to campus, show off the stadium with the lights on, and kind of do some things with trying on jerseys and kind of getting everything. We do a highlight video. But once they leave campus there, we bring them down to, a, to basically the Jackson Square area, which is a very famous spot in New Orleans. And yeah. we bring two or three buses down, we drop them off, and we've got a band there, a police escort, and we basically parade through the streets of New Orleans. Sweet. We walk right to the front door of the place we're having dinner, and it usually – it's right there and the band is going everybody's dancing and uh so it's we, we try to show off new orleans we when we yeah. first took the job here we were concerned we were almost going to have to hide new orleans we, we didn't <laughs> but as we've <laughs> as we've grown and and understood it better ourselves we've understood what a what a unique place it is culturally uh it's such an iconic city that we, we put it front and center and and because we have some folks who come on visits who aren't quite sure of sending their son to a university in new orleans and so we try to yeah, put true. Ears at ease and show them what it is to actually come and experience new orleans you know you guys do some really cool stuff i, I want you to explain the swag shop because i saw that video online this last year i was like this is the greatest thing ever you know it's it was fun because i was uh i i, I kind of light up with a smile there because i was there was about two or three of us that were heavily involved in doing that so that one's near and dear to my heart our first year you know Tulane doesn't have a rich bowl history, so they haven't been to very many bowl games. And so they had come off a period of time. I think when we took the job, they hadn't been since 2013, and that was the New Orleans Bowl in town. Yeah. You know, we're only the second – this past year we went to a second bowl game in a row, and that's only the second time in school history that's happened. And we're the first team in school history to win back-to-back -back bowl games. So we've tried to make a big deal of it, and it was something we set as a goal. And uh, our second year we were 5-7, and seven, and literally the – Season came down to the final play. Quarterback yeah. tried to get in at the goal line and went to instant replay and, quite honestly, could have been called either way. So we were literally an inch short of going to a bowl game our second year. Then we made the Cure Bowl in Orlando after the 2018 season, and we knew that they were going to get some gear from them. Our equipment staff does a great job. You know, we have a great contract with Nike and getting some, beer, uh, some bowl gifts uh, for them and some gear. So we, well, we were so rushed for time. By the time we got into actually into the planning process, we kind of threw it together late. We tried to put a spin on it, tried to have some fun with it. But then coming off of the 18, after the Cure Bowl, we had kind of a year to plan. So we got our creative juices going for sure. So myself, a couple of guys in the recruiting side, uh, our equipment manager, you know, those guys do a great job of coming up with our uniforms and looking for creative ways. But once we knew that that's where we're going and we had the date, so we, we found a space at the hotel and we just literally just started coming up with any – corny slash fun idea you could think of and we had nice. kind of called it the swag shop the year before just for a lack of a better word but then we kind of took it to another level with turning it into kind of almost like a nightclub atmosphere yeah. and our strength staff was in we had t-shirts made that they were the, the bouncers they were the staff for that night yeah. we had velvet rope outside the room and I had gone nice. through that day and basically while the guys were at practice um I went to each of their hotel rooms and slid invitations under their door. Oh, cool. Uh, only the people who had an invitation were allowed to come into the swag shop. So we tried to make it a little bit exclusive. And so our strength staff was out front. And if you didn't show up with your invitation, they didn't let you in. So, <laughs> but I know that you know, guy we, working the rope, that dude was ripped. Yeah, they're, they're, they're <laughs> playing into that. They had, and the great thing was everybody, even as corny as it was, 
everybody did a great job on our staff of jumping in because that's one of those things you're, you're doing it, you're thinking about, it, you just you hope the kids like it. Yeah. Um, and it was great because one, we had a bunch of stuff to give them. They got a bunch of gifts from the bowl, and the kids really kind of ate it up and had a good time with it. Because sometimes with this age group, you could do some things and they can look at you, right. old folks, and think, "Why would you think we thought that was cool?" <laughs> No, it was a it was a big hit. We called it Club Green, so we had a bunch of green lights in there. We kind of turned down the lights, made them all green. Um, my equipment guy got a fog machine. He was DJing, and <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Pelican mascot head on, and so no, there was it was it was a lot of fun stuff, and, and created a little bit of fun. Stuff. That that's really cool. Uh, I don't think I can get a 33 on the ACT anymore, JR. I don't think I can. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to have to work on my speed to try and get in some other way. You might you might get a JR. I think I might fall oh, no. a little short. I don't know. I have two questions. The first one is, can JR and I get an invite to the swag shop this coming year? That's the first question. I want to see. Well, that's that's I mean, the hard part for it. Like, we literally, as soon as we shut down the swag shop, my equipment guy and I looked at each other, and without saying anything, we both had the same thought like, Okay, we really kind of box ourselves at a corner because next year it's happy. <laughs> oh, so now right, we've exactly. really got we've kind of put some pressure on ourselves to exceed this past one. So we're gonna have to get even more creative. But no, you bet. Well, we'll the, get you down to check it out. Oh, awesome. that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. I'm totally down with that. I mean, I can't be a bouncer. I can't do that. But I'm totally into you know. I'll come in and hang out. It's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, I want to know this: What's it like working for Coach Fritz? You know, for me, it's 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 the reason I. Hey, it was it was hard for me to leave the job I left. It was hard to leave doing what I was doing. I, you know, a lot of times people ask about the difference between working on the football side of thing, and they, they they're surprised that a guy working in football was actually coaching girls basketball. Yeah. You know, I loved coaching girls basketball. It was it was awesome for me. That was a really tough decision. But the reason the decision. Even as tough it was, it was also a pretty easy decision because it gave me the opportunity to go back and work for him. I've known Coach Fritz since 1997, actually 96, technically, because he came in to interview at that time. But he took over after my second year at Central Missouri. So played for him, worked for him, multiple capacities. And, and you know, so I have a probably a, a little bit more extensive relationship than most of the people. There's a few coaches on our staff that he's worked with even longer than myself. But you know, he's, he's a father figure to me. So working with him on a daily basis has, has been awesome. He, he trusts me. So he extends me maybe a little bit of rope that other head coaches wouldn't extend to their ops guys. I'm allowed to, when I talk about being the hammer academically, if he walks down the hall and I'm getting after a guy, the first thing he does is he joins in and tells the guy, Hey, you better do what he's telling you. He doesn't question me as far as, Hey, are you sure you should have been that hard? And he knows if it's gotten to that level that, there's reason. He allows me to – I have a little bit of a sarcastic side to me. <laughs> uh, he allows me to, to use that, especially with our coaching staff sometimes. I have to say the same thing over and over for those guys. Uh, so he allows me that freedom. So, no, it's, it's great. He sets out pretty clear expectations, and it's here you go. You, you're either going to live up to them or you're not. And it, it, we have a great staff also coming to work. Is a, it's a really fun place to be, you know, just from the – I say social aspect, but just from interacting, just the time in between meetings or right before or right after a staff meeting. And, you know, we had a staff meeting via Zoom today, and uh, one of our younger coaches was giving a presentation. And, you know, as a young coach sometimes will do, he was talking maybe a little bit longer than he should have. <laughs> and we couldn't wait for the call to end, so we could all time and start giving him trouble. So it's just, you know, we, we, have, we have fun for sure. And Coach Fritz sets that, but at the same time, there's also expectation to get your work done and He's great because he's not gonna he's not gonna micromanage. He's not gonna come in yelling and screaming. He's hey, I need this done, and here's what I expect it. And everybody does their best to live up to that. You know, I've seen after your wins, they'll show some footage of the uh, the locker room, and he's he's up there body surfing. Oh yeah, it's it's. We look forward to. I can remember that singing that song as a player back in the, <laughs> the late nineties. It's that becomes a rallying cry at times. Hey, we want to sing that song tonight. So he's got a little song he sings right before that, and then. The body surfing is something that's probably evolved in the last probably decade or so. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's – what people don't understand, especially, you know, you can be in awe of some, some programs where they just win and win and win. But winning's hard. Every, yeah. every week yeah. it's – Yes, I mean, it is. And you don't understand it until you get in and you're on that side of things or you know the way things are supposed to go, but you see how they actually go and you know a guy's supposed to do this and you've told him all week to do this, but then he does – 
he's 19 years old and he does something the complete opposite. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, it's everybody's got talent, everybody's got great stabs, and it's every week just seems like it's coming down to a play here, a play there. And the coach does a great job of, hey, we're, we're, we're going to celebrate victories. We're, we, they're a big deal. So we never want to get bored with winning for sure. So it's, it, it's, he, he does a great job. Of, and he did that too when they were having tremendous success at Sam Houston going to national championship. They were celebrating every win like it was the Super Bowl. So yeah. mm -hmm. keeps your guys motivated and keeps winning fresh and uh, keeps those guys wanting to, to, to keep those things going. You know, and you mentioned playing for him up at UCM, and you're a member of the UCM Hall of Fame. Allegedly. Allegedly. It's been a long time. I, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> and, you know, you're very involved with the special teams still uh, at this point. I, I'm really curious, what are you looking for in a, in a Division I special teams player? The guys that we look at for really niche positions are going to be your long snapper, your punter, and your kicker. Returners, you're, you're going to find those as you recruit other positions and you find guys who can return. You know, long snappers, it's, that's almost a little bit of a black and white position. If they can throw it back there, they can throw it back there. You're looking a little bit with mental makeup with those guys, making sure they can handle pressure. We were very fortunate. Uh, we recruited a guy our first year here at, or our, when we first got the job here. Uh, we signed a young man out of, out of Texas, Garrett Utterly, snapped for us for the last four years. Literally didn't have one bad snap in four years. Wow. So that's wow. a part of the game where – that's one of those things you only notice it or appreciate it when it's going bad. You know, that's when it stands out. But he was a guy who was super solid, but had a great makeup. Uh, wasn't going to get too riled. Knew he had a job to do. Um, and then obviously you're looking some measurables with those guys as far as can they cover, can they tackle. Punters, that one I think is a little bit easier to evaluate than kickers are. One, because there's a little bit different mental makeup to it. And two, with the high school kickers kicking off of blocks, that can sometimes – cloud things because you got to make the transition to the ground. So yeah. you're trying to find some footage. And the good thing about not, you know, all these kids are now going to camps and clinics and they're getting footage and they're sending you clips that aren't necessarily games of their senior year, things like that. So you're getting more access to more information. So that helps. But again, it's, it's getting those kids, if you can get them on a visit and for lack of a better word, size them up a little bit and try to figure out their mental makeup and see if they can handle Cause that's a position that can go, go sideways pretty quick, yeah. speaking from experience. When, for me, I had a couple of tough stretches in my career, and when that snowball started in the wrong direction, it was, it was tough to get it stopped. So you want to you wanna try and make sure a kid can handle that. But obviously you're looking just like everybody else's leg strength, accuracy, those type of things. But it can definitely be a transition as a kicker going from the high school game to the, to the college level. So rumor holds you kicked two 50-yard-plus field goals in college. I think that's what the media got. So I think I, <laughs> I, I'll take the word for it. Yeah, I, I, we, there, was a, there was a couple uh, couple big ones in there. And, uh, you know, the best part is I think uh, both of them helped lead to victory. So awesome. even more, hit a big one against St. Cloud. There was a 52-yarder. No, it's, it's, it's fun stuff looking back on that. But, you know, guys all the time are asking me, hey, do you think you can still kick? I, I think my leg might actually fall. Off if I, <laughs> try to do something like that. And there's – I came along at a time when I was still probably still on the upward wave of more of your specialized guys getting into it. You know, I came from the soccer side of things. It was more and more kids doing that. Um, and I was on that initial wave, but you look across the country now, there's so many at every level, there's so many good kickers doing things that I could only dream of. So no, it's the, the depth of that position has definitely skyrocketed the last 20 years. Yeah. JR, I, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but Coach Meyer, I just want you to know, I still have a year of eligibility. And and I was the backup punter when I was in college. I was a middle linebacker, but God blessed me with good legs. So I'll work on my ACT score, but don't don't be shocked if you don't see some film of me kicking out in the front yard here in the next couple of weeks. You can get yourself to a camp and maybe, maybe get a spark time or something. Shane, he, he asked – a guy at Prep Star, if he could get him recruited for crying out loud. I mean, th this is the other ongoing saga going hey, on. Hey, you can't, they can't tell you yes if you don't ask them. <laughs> That's right. And you said you're looking for guys who could tackle. I could tackle. I'm, I'm very good at that. I'm, uh, I'm not good at a lot of things. I'm going to be honest. I'm not, I struggle, but I could do that. So I want to, I want to ask you another question. And I, I doubt your leg would fall off. I'm guessing you're out there kicking at practice sometimes. No, I haven't. Uh, honestly, the last time in the last probably 15, 18 years I kicked, I, when we were at Georgia Southern, I had a, one of our guys I work with kind of 
challenged me to a to a contest and so I kicked that day and that's been about the only day in a probably since 2002 <laughs> I've kicked football so oh my goodness uh, all right well get not back too to much you. of that I honestly you know it, with my job position now I am not out at practice a lot we practice in the morning and so when our guys go out to practice it's a great time for me yeah. to actually get work done mm-hmm. um, the office is quiet I can get some things done but other than going out for the last little bit of team which is usually at the end of practice and, and watching those things I'll go out and help make announcements at the end but no my, my time at practice is actually on the on the lower side of things well tell everybody who your rival is and why you know our rival is you know I don't know that we have just one our, our conference is so deep and you know we look at our schedule you'd like to they all look at your schedule and go, well, there's four or five. We don't have to, <laughs> we can kind of count those, but yeah, you know, when we go through and look at it, the, the, the American is such a competitive league. Obviously you have some natural ones with our side of the division. You know, we Houston's become a little bit more of a rivalry because we play them each year. Uh, had the great game with them last year. Memphis, obviously they're also on our side. Our games with Navy each year have started to come down to the wire every year. We also played them every year. They're on our side of the division, but, you know, there's, it used to be at UCM, you know, we got geared up for Pitt State for sure. I can remember my, after playing my first game at UCM, as soon as the buzzer sounded, guys started talking about Pitt State because it was the following week. And that was the first time I had been, you know, really part of a rivalry like that. But here it's, you know, we're so locked in on just one, you know, coach preaches all the time, one week at a time that, although we'd sure like to beat those guys at SMU, because I think right now we haven't beaten them in the last four years. We've had some real heartbreaking games and, we just had a coach of ours move on to to coach uh, take a position at Duke. Um, oh. When he addressed the team and left, he said, "The one thing I'm gonna ask you guys is next year you better beat SMU because I'm going forward and you guys better fix that." So <laughs> there you go. Uh, that's kind of where we are right now. You know, Shane, you're with the national championship game. Uh, can you tell everybody about that? Yeah, I think it was. You know, I was probably fortunate in that I work at a university that's in the city that was hosting the national championship game. But last spring, they reached out, the college football advisory group who puts on the game, they reached out and just asked me, they were coming into town, bringing their whole group in uh, to walk through the different hotel sites and practice sites and all that. So they just asked me if I would mind just being a part of the group and tagging along and showing, sharing some local information because they brought in, you know, part of that group, they were bringing in ops guys from teams that were probably traditionally going to be in the hunt. So even at that spring meeting, you had guys from Ohio State and Clemson and Alabama and Notre Dame, and you know, there was a, which was great for me because you start picking their brains or seeing the yeah. way they look at things and new and creative ideas. So, but they bring those folks in because they've been a part of it. So they start looking at things they need to, obstacles they may have with being in New Orleans or how can they do this and that. So that was great. So I just got to be a part of that for about a day and a half and then, not too long before the national championship game, I think they had somebody who couldn't make it. So they reached out and asked me if I could be a liaison for one of the teams. And so then when I showed up day one, I got assigned to LSU. And basically it was, you, you were with the team, travel with them to practice on a couple of days when we traveled, they practiced out at the Saints facility, which we use as a practice facility as well. Um, and they stayed at a hotel down, down in downtown. So it was helping with, you know, there's an outside group they bring into work security. Nobody could get on their floors wow. if they wanted to. But getting on the buses, going from the front door, even though it's not very far to get on the bus, just helping with barricades and crowd control and making sure that they had a clean path. And obviously then on game day, you know, President Trump was making an appearance. So right. I came right. down to about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and there was about 500 people checking in the hotel in the lobby on game day and come to figure out it was actually Secret Service. They were all getting <laughs> <laughs> afternoon helping with that event so that added another layer which I had not seen I had not been a part of that before so it was it was neat to kind of see the that added level of security and the steps people take to you know different check marks and, and things like that so no it was a great experience and then it was great because to be honest with you I didn't have many once the team got to the stadium I didn't have very many responsibilities so I was walking around and was just like a fan you know seeing all the ESPN yeah. person walking by Marty Smith and, you know, just nice. get a kick out of it that I was actually that close. And I stood right at the 25-yard line right outside the team box and watched the game from there. The whole oh, wow. so it was, a, oh, it was a great atmosphere, and it, it was a really unique experience with, you know, LSU's 80 miles down the road. So right. they obviously were very well represented. And having them 
and having them win the game in the Superdome. Probably, you know, not, that's the first national championship game I've been to. But it'd be hard pressed, I think, to find a more electric environment just because it wasn't a true home field for them, but it was, it was pretty close at the same time. Yeah, sure. I want to I want to pick your brain a little bit. Like you said, you were able to talk to all the other ops guys, and I'm going to compliment a guy on the Jefferson City staff named Paul. Paul is kind of our director of football ops, does all this stuff you're talking about, other duties is assigned, maintained a full-time job and still did it. And I don't even know how he did all of it, to be honest with you. How important is it in your mind that this, this role that you're, you're manning come all the way down to the high school level? I know it'd be tough at smaller schools. I understand because of people and stuff, but how important is it in your mind that you find a guy who can do this and how does that increase the value of your program? Well, it's, it's nice because, you know, when things go well, my position's pretty easy. The scary part about my job is I can make all the phone calls and touch base and contact and have everything set up, but I still, every time we land on a plane, first thing I'm doing is leaning out the window, seeing if I see buses. <laughs> I'm still holding my breath that, even though I've talked to the driver right before we've taken off and told them we're taking off on time and we'll be there at X time. Did they go to the right FBO? Did they, right. are they not sitting out somewhere in a parking lot and lost track? You just hold your breath. And so I think even at all levels with all that goes on with actually coaching the sport, I think having somebody who's a little bit removed in a quote unquote off the field role to where when something wrong happens, like buses aren't there, plane is late, you don't have a coach who's got his mind in one place with trying to win a football game, dealing with those issues. Hey, if you can knock all of your stuff out on a Monday and make sure your buses are there, you got your meal set up, all that stuff is good and there's no issues, great. But it's when issues arise, it's great to have somebody who's solely focused on those things. And I think that'd be a big help, but no matter the level, because it could just, you know, and you have somebody who has, is, in the trenches and knows the details of it and knows how to problem solve a little bit quicker than having to first figure out what the problem is and then have to figure out what the solution is. Most times I, if there is a problem, I'll at least know the first couple steps to, to start working to solve it. So, and there can be, we've had some issues on our own. We've had a few nightmare trips where our second year at Georgia Southern, we were flying with a new airline and Unfortunately, we didn't deal directly with the airline. We used a middleman, university, business office, signed the contract. So, you know, I just kind of came in late on the back end of the deal. And it was our first game of the year. We were going to play West Virginia. So everybody was excited about making that trip, playing them. You know, everybody's excited. Hey, we're going to go shock the world, all that. Everybody's right. geared up. And we literally have everybody in our facility getting ready to get on buses, probably less than an hour away from just getting on buses to head to the airport. And I get a phone call that the plane's going to be late because there was some miscommunication and the plane is being used for another team, which they didn't tell me ahead of time, which I would have made plans for had I known we were piggybacking, which isn't uncommon. Mm -hmm. But the plane thought they were leaving Monroe, Louisiana at 10 a.m. The team thought they were leaving at 1 p.m. So they couldn't just leave the team there. So mm. the plane had to wait around and not depart till 1 p.m. and had to fly to – they were playing NC State, Louisiana Monroe was, so they flew to Raleigh, North Carolina, then had to fly to us. So we were a couple hours behind leaving. We didn't get to the hotel till we basically walked in, got some dinner, got everybody to bed. So it was it was a tough trip getting up. And then as the trip played out and started putting pieces together, well, we were both playing night games. And because their game started 30 minutes before ours, <laughs> they played NC State at 6.30. We played West Virginia at 7. Well, they flew from Raleigh, North Carolina to Monroe, Louisiana, and then came back to Morgantown, West Virginia to pick us up. And we were in an FBO, which for most people don't know, that's kind of the private sections of airports where, you know, mm -hmm. you're usually just dealing with, you know, more of your private jets and things like that. So it's the FBO, some, most FBOs, even the real nice ones, aren't real big. They're not designed to hold hundreds and hundreds of people. But this one was not on the extravagant side, so it was <laughs> – there wasn't a lot of seats, let me just tell you that. So I've got 150 people in a travel party all crammed into this because once you went through screening, they, weren't, they didn't want you to go anywhere. Sure. We're all crammed in there. People are literally sleeping on the floor, under seats. I've got the president of our university included in that mix. <laughs> 
and we don't take off from one, we lose, I think, 44 nothing. We don't take off from that small airport in West Virginia until after 3.30 in the morning. So it was not exactly a, a, a great start to team travel that year. So, you know, those are things you, you hear about you don't want to go through, but, you know, everybody probably – I think every ops guy in the country has a nightmare scenario in there. Yeah. Right now, mind. So hopefully that will stay at the top of the list for no matter how long I do this job. I hope so. Basically what I, what I hear, and I'm going to shout out to all administrators, athletic directors, whatever you're paying that dude is well worth it because the problems are going to be magnified well above what you're paying him if you don't have somebody doing it. So, yeah. you know, you're all these other duties as assigned, I totally get it. And I know your value because I'm looking at your list of duties and I know what you're going through and people can't see your eyes when you're telling this story. And I know that story is still sitting there. You, every time you're scheduling something, you're like, if I get another Morgantown, I'm going to, I'm going to go off on somebody. No. And that's where it's, cause it's sometimes it's pure luck. You know, we just, uh, just yesterday we had a conference call with all the ops guys in our conference just to kind of touch base and the conference, you know, we've got, there's a director of operations that works for the American conference. So he wanted to get us all together and just see if there were any issues, any problems we were all kind of encountering with, with COVID-19 going on. And obviously it's creating issues for all of us, but booking charter flights, because, you know, we're still in the, we had everything lined up, ready to go with a contract. We've used Sun Country Airlines for the last couple of years, very happy. Um, and then this hit, so our general counsel at the university level wanted to make sure there was language in the contract to cover it in case, you know, we're still looking at hopefully having a full season, but is it going to be in the spring? Are they going to shorten it down? When is it going to start? Nobody knows. So making sure you have language built in. So there's some universities in our conference who aren't letting them go to contract at all. So, and you have some airlines trying to figure out what they're doing on that side of things. Normally all of this stuff would be done. None of us were able to really get out and, when the conference schedule came out, you know, you've got a couple of weeks to kind of, and most of us use an outside source to get some groundwork laid as far as which hotels will be an option. But then for the most part, we all take a week and hop around city to city and go see a couple hotels in each and make sure it fits your needs. Well, literally we were kicked out of our building the week before I was planning on making my trips around the country. So <laughs> a lot of us are doing it sight unseen, which can create stress and you're, just going off references and, you know, hoping guys tell you the truth, but I hold my breath every time we land and hope there are buses. So you're, you know, I order a post game meal and hope there's 180 orders of Chick-fil-A sitting out there. But until I walk outside and see somebody there with 180, I, I hope it comes. <laughs> yeah. Right. A couple nice. years ago, we played at Houston on a Thursday night ESPN game. And so we're set to leave out late. No, that's going to happen. So by the time we, you know, you play the game at 7 p.m. By the time everybody showers, gets on the bus, gets traveling, we'll have a post-game meal at the stadium, but then part of our airline contract is there's a box meal getting on the flight. Well, we had a little bit of issue with our post-game meal. It was a little short on the amount of food. So you think, okay, well, it's a good thing we have that second meal built in. Well, we get to the airport. I'm asking where the caterer is. Nobody knows. Well, I find oh. out the next day that the caterer wrote down 1 p.m. instead of 1 a.m. Oh, my gosh. So had no catered meal because the caterer that the airline farmed out wrote down the time. Room. Everybody along the chain up until somebody wrote that time down had done everything correct. But right. because somebody wrote down PM instead of AM, I got 165 people getting on a plane and expecting a sandwich and a candy bar. And I didn't have it. Oh, so no. it's just those type of things that can, it can create a little stress and anxiety. So how is it traveling with kids who've never flown on a plane before? You know, we've got a handful. Obviously, you get, you know, your new batch of incomers um, or newcomers each year that come in, and we've got a handful. But for the most part, you know, the teams that I've been around, other than guys maybe being a little bit nervous, uh, we haven't had too many issues on that side. And guys have handled it well. We haven't had anybody say they aren't going to fly or can't overcome any sort of anxiety. So it's been – I mean, I know we've had some guys who have been, been nervous. For the most part, those guys handle it really well. You know, Shane, you mentioned also uh, something you were telling us about that, that you take care of the the care logs, I think is the way to say it. And I was looking at it. I had no idea what it was. I think it might be kind of interesting for people to know what that is. You bet. The, the NCAA, NCAA mandates how many hours a week you're allowed to actually work with your guys. CARA is countable, athletically related activities. 
the three main ones that fall into that are obviously practice, any meetings you're having, and then any lifting you're doing. Okay. So anything physical or football related. Treatment, seeing a nutritionist, going in and getting treatment and training, those things are all exempted from that. So those don't count in your 20 hours. Um, and then during the season, you have to give them one day completely off. In the last couple of years, they've changed. there's actually now a RERA, which is required athletically related activities. Some schools vary on the day off they give their guys. Okay. A lot of schools may give Monday off. Well, that's when they were doing their press conference. So now a guy had to come up on his day off and do press conference. Okay. So the instituted RERA, basically now the rule is whatever your day off is, you better not ask them to do anything related to football. Right. Other than maybe coming in for treatment. So you've got to keep track of that as well. For us, luckily, we do all our media on Tuesday, so it's never an issue. So basically what I have to do is catalog each day what we've done, when it started, you know, when it ended, that type of thing. And at the end of the week, I there's an online system we use where I enter those things in, make sure it's under 20 hours a week. And then when I submit it, it goes to our compliance office who double checks it. And then it then gets emailed out to every guy on our team and they have the option to, it's not a mandatory thing, but they have the option to look at it and approve it or if they have anything to dispute or think we actually went over those hours, they can voice those concerns then. Okay. So that's how we operate during the season. Then when you get into more of your out of season, so for us the spring, we get eight hours a week. Hmm. So when you think about your winter lifting and stuff, we get eight hours a week. And no, it's not. And up to two of those hours can be spent watching film. Hmm. But for the most part, the good thing is during the month of January and into February, all of our position coaches are out recruiting. So we couldn't meet if anybody wanted to. All of those eight hours are devoted to strength and conditioning. And then during that time, you have to give two days off. Basically, we work our guys Monday through Friday. They get Saturday and Sunday off. Yeah. Then when we get into our spring ball period, you kind of go back to your in-season model of 20 hours a week and only having to give one day off. It's more like an in-season routine. But then the other catch is from January 1st until the start of training camp, you have to give your guys nine full weeks off. Huh. Now, most times, because of when school starts, they get the first two weeks of January, we can count, because school hasn't even started yet. Our guys right. aren't around. Right. Yeah. We count spring break, so that's three. We usually take – we have to give one week off during the summer, which we usually base around 4th of July. But then we've got to find five other weeks where we cut our guys loose. Now – it sounds like a lot, but basically what that allows is for basically once the end of the spring semester comes and guys are done with finals, they're all going to go home for a period of time before summer workouts start anyway. And, you know, they didn't come up with that number randomly. It's basically the number of weeks you have left before that starts. But those guys get nine weeks off from any sort of activity built into the calendar, then not counting the one and two days off they get basically off as well on those. So. No, those are the things, you know, and I've got to track that and make sure because, and, you know, our, luckily our schedule has been pretty smooth, but I'd hate to be an ops guy in the Mac. It would probably be pretty tough with Kara because they're playing games on Tuesday night and Wednesday night. Yeah. And it takes a lot of forethought. And I'm talking about during the summertime, we only have one Thursday night game this year, but I've got to look at it and make sure that our day off corresponds. Cause once you decide, Hey, this is going to be our seven day period, whether it's Sunday to Saturday or, Monday to Sunday, that's locked in for the rest of the year. Oh. You've got to make sure your calendar is set up that that day off, you can still find a day off within those seven days. So you've got to make sure it works. So, you know, a lot of people think you got to give a day off every seven days. But like for us with the Thursday night game, what we'll do is we'll actually, our weeks will be set up Sunday to Saturday. So we'll give them off that very first Sunday of week one. We'll go through, play the game on Saturday. And then we'll bring our guys right back in on Sunday because a new week has started. Mm -hmm. And then we play the game on Thursday. We bring them in just to watch film on Friday, and they get that following Saturday. So okay. Days up. But those are the types of things you got to look at. Otherwise, you can get yourself in a spot where if you just randomly, hey, we'll go Sunday to Saturday without looking at your game schedule, it can create some issues where you've got to give a day off. Your head coach doesn't want to give off. So yeah, right. you've got to got to really get make sure everybody's on the same page and map it out. And, uh, make sure he understands, you know, that he's got to choose those days off. You can't get in and all of a sudden go, hey, I think we're feeling pretty good. Let's give this day off instead of that one or change on the fly. You've got to have some of those things set in stone. I don't think people really realize how much it goes into if your schedule does change, you know, and you're not playing every Saturday. Because I would have never known that with a Thursday night game, thinking about you got to start the calendar from week one to be able to accommodate that. And that may be week five. 
Well, it's it's the same thing like with a bye week. So if, if you're not playing on Saturday, well, you're probably giving your guys off on Saturday. Well, what you'd like to do is maybe bring them in Sunday for a jump start on the week. So you've got to look at those weeks too and say, okay, if we want to bring our guys back on Sunday to get a jump start on the next opponent, how are we building in a day off to make sure – or your head coach has to know, hey, as tempted as we are to bring guys back in on Sunday night, we can't. Yeah. So – don't just call it a day off and everybody's got to know we're starting right back after it Monday morning. I'm worn out. I mean, direct. And that's to- nothing compared to eligibility and APR. Are- <laughs> yeah. Director, of, director yeah. of football operations does not qualify or quantify your title. It has, I mean, I don't even know what kind of calendar you use to keep track of all that coach. I don't No, It's, it's just, you know, you, it's, it's one of those things too, where you, you learn from mistakes yeah. you learn that, you know, after you get through, it's like, dang, why didn't I think of that? You start training yourself to think almost six months ahead. Just today, I had a conversation with one of our guys on the recruiting side. I talked about our second line earlier. Well, we better start making plans for December that, one, the city of New Orleans isn't going to grant us a parade permit for a second line because of COVID. And, fingers crossed, we're able to put 100 and something people in the same restaurant. Mm -hmm. You know, where we have big – you know, hopefully those things are relaxing, but we better start thinking about – okay, what would we do if those aren't an option? Are we going to divide people up into two or three different restaurants at the same time? Or how are we going to start? We're going to to probably have to adjust our visit no matter, but we've got to start having those conversations now instead of heading into the last week of the season and now you're looking at your recruiting weekend. So those are the things you got to start start planning ahead and start looking at. You, You just, you train yourself to look. I've already basically got team travel for the fall. Other than calling six restaurants and booking a post-game meal, team travel's basically done. You know, like I said, recruiting weekends in December, and then once we start getting into the early part of the season, you start requesting bowl manuals, and you start looking at bowl games, and you start, even though you have no idea where you're going to go, you know the conference tie-ins. There was probably three or four bowl games I had kind of a game plan for and a calendar for just waiting for the decision to be made Hey, this is the bowl game. You're okay. I, I'm familiar with that one. I know what we're going to. I say that, and <laughs> we went to the Armed Forces Bowl this past year. Yeah. And it was on no one's radar until the, the night before the AD called the head coach and I and said, Hey, looks like Armed Forces, which like we had not done any planning and not given it. But ESPN, the bowl committees, they start getting the, the dominoes start falling. And all of a sudden now we're going to a bowl game that didn't have a conference tie-in, one we weren't expecting. So now you're jumping in and you're, you're trying to track down a bowl manual real quick. You're calling the teams that participated in it last year and you're, you're doing some things on the fly. So even your best planning sometimes can, can be, be off and out. Yeah. Holy, holy cow. Jeez. Coach, this has been incredible. I, I take notes as I go and I, I don't even know how to quantify all this stuff that you, I hope you have help in. I mean, I, I'm sure you have something, but the amount of knowledge in your head is incredible with all this stuff from Kara to liaison, to academics, to taking care of knuckleheads, to writing logs and reports. It's totally amazing. I think what people sometimes lose in translation when they're watching on a Saturday is what goes in to take care of those athletes so they can get to Saturday. Our athletic director, because he, he talks about it. It's not when, easy. You know, when he, when we have our all staff meetings with everybody, he tells everybody their their number one job is to remove any obstacle in the way of our student athlete, which that's the same way for us as coaches. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that come game day, come Saturday, everything, the path is cleared for them to go out and perform to their best of their ability. And then my job's a little bit different in that what I do for student athletes may not show up necessarily on a Saturday. I'm not in the film room. I'm not in the meeting room. But what I'm trying to do is is take obstacles out of the way for our coaches. You know, not just team travel, but like when our coaches go out recruiting, I book all of their travel. They all have university credit cards, but I reconcile all of their credit card receipts and do all of their reports and get their per diem it to where they don't have to – when they come back in on Sunday, Probably. hey, just drop me your receipts and get back out on the road. Like, don't – you don't need to be in here spending time doing this. You need to be on the phone talking to kids – setting kids up for visit, trying to get a kid to commit. You don't need to mess with this stuff. You need to, for lack of a better word, just coach ball. The size of school we're at with Tulane and the size of our staff, we've got plenty of help, but we've got the right amount of help where people can take ownership on their areas. Yeah. Guys can trust other folks on staff to do their job. We can pitch in when we have to, but it's very clear 
and delineated lines of who's responsible for what and, and now go get your job done. Coach, when are your camp dates? Well, we had one for May 31st, but uh, we're still under uh, stay-at-home orders in New Orleans, I think, until May 16th. So I'm pretty certain that one's not going to happen. So we're to be determined on that. Um, we'll, we'll wait and dictate, when, one, what our city allows, then, two, what our university starts to plans for reopening. And then there's probably also going to be – I'm sure at some point the NSA is going to have to step in and say, right. hey, even though, you know, I look at competitive advantage and – you know, schools in our conference, if they're allowed to bring their guys a whole back a whole month before we are, even just for summer workouts, that's that's a pretty big head start on everybody else. So are they going to step in and, and start laying down some mandates that carry nationwide? So I'm sure those decisions are, are still going to come. The night after all of this turned crazy when Rudy Gobert tested positive and the NBA shut down, that we practiced the next morning. And we had a practice set up for Saturday morning. And I can remember telling somebody, I'll be surprised if we practice Saturday morning. By the time Friday rolled around, they asked us to hold off on practice, and we brought our guys in Saturday morning for a team meeting instead, and that's when the AD said that you just announced, hey, everybody's going home. So we had a day or two to get everybody organized and make sure they had everything they needed to go home. So, you know, we got five spring ball practices in, but some of the schools in our conference hadn't even started spring football yet. But to, in, in a time like this, the number of spring ball prices each of us had ranks pretty low on the worldwide concerns right now. But uh, once we get into our own little bubbles and we get back into some normalcy, you know, that stuff becomes pretty important when you're trying to win football games. So hopefully we can back, get back to a time where that does become important to everybody again. Absolutely. And it has – I mean, the season has to go on, if not for any other reason than – JR and I are coming to the swag shop. I mean, that's, yeah. that's really probably the number one reason why Tulane has to have a season this year. JR, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm all for it because if we have a swag shop, it means we go to a bowl game and uh, we'd, we'd be pretty excited about, about three in a row. That's for sure. Well, let's do that's it. great. Well, another exciting episode, JR. We have Director of Football Operations at all. Yeah. <laughs> Add in whatever else you want. Shane Meyer here from Green Wave Football down at Tulane. Thank you, Shane, very much. We've enjoyed it. You bet. Hey, and before I get off, I'd be remiss in not extending a, a quick congratulations to Kay Foster. Just saw she got the, the head job there for the Lady J. So, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have Kay on my staff while I was there. And no doubt she'll do a great job. And uh, she, she'll do a great job for those kids, most importantly. So they'll, they'll enjoy everything she brings, not just on the floor, but off the floor as well. So super excited for Kay that uh, she's going to get that opportunity after – a lot of years invested, not just in Jeff City, but in basketball. So super excited for her and her family.